this is lecture 1a for this is lecture 1a for public administration 6123 the economic development course for the spring 2017 semester the title of this lecture why local economic development and in the course of this lecture we're going to be covering a couple of topics uh, that have to pertain to chapter one of the primary text we are using, the Blakely and Lee text, Planning Local Economic Development Theory and Practice. Uh, this will cover uh, large parts of uh, chapter one, uh, where it kind of starts off with some overview of uh, the practice of economic development. So we're going to talk a little bit about the past in terms of the, how the, our national co economy has developed and then its uh, development of that national economy and its implications at the local level, regional level. Look at the present landscape of our economy, uh, how what's going on at a global level and national level is affecting us regionally and locally, and then talk about the future, particularly the uncertainty of the future. And what all this means not just in terms of why we need economic development, but what happens without economic development. Because uh, in particularly for those of you taking this class who are uh, residents or natives of East Carolina, uh, Eastern North Carolina, I'm sorry, you, you understand that there are a lot of challenges that are created as a result of the lack of economic development, especially when compared to other parts of North Carolina and other parts of the country in the last uh, eight to ten years or even longer. And we'll talk a little bit about what those challenges are and why, as a matter of public policy, we incorporate economic development into our overall plans and why it takes such a prominent role in overall policy discussion. So first of all, um, the text in Chapter 1 does do a lot to provide uh, an overview of really trying to understand kind of how our overall economy developed, uh, particularly I would say probably during the first 200 years of U.S. history as a nation, and especially that uh, 180 years of history, 170 years of history that existed here uh, in the former colonies uh, from the time that uh, first uh, British colonies were established here in the U.S. Uh, in U.S. territories in the early 1600s all the way through the Revolution. And uh, they were originally, of course, this area was developed predominantly for agricultural purposes. Uh, there was a lot of farmland. Uh, that farmland was used for the production of crops. Uh, there were certain crops that uh, there was an effort to try to bring over here. Uh, but there was also other activities as well. But uh, cotton, tobacco, uh, other smaller crops, rice, even in some parts, particularly those of you familiar with the Carolinas, and other crops were grown here in the American colonies and eventually later in the American, straight, American states and were a source of revenue as, a, as tradable commodities uh, with Britain and also other parts of Europe. The, the, the economy then started to transition into a more industrial or uh, manufacturing economy. That, of course, the earliest uh, periods of that started in the early 19th century, but really took off in the mid 19th century and especially after the end of the Civil War. Both our growth in agriculture and our growth in manufacturing uh, can be tied also directly to our labor and our labor advantage as a nation. Um, our strong and, and relatively open uh, a our openness with respect to the fact that we were a nation that was founded by immigrants uh, and as such constantly the, this influx of population into uh, the American uh, to the American continent to the Americas uh, throughout and even up to today we still have a pretty robust immigration um, immigration totals uh, you look at what People, at legal immigration today, not even accounting for illegal immigration. When you look at, Ill at legal immigration today, uh, we are still relatively strong. Several million uh, people enter the United States legally every year, in addition to those who enter illegally. So we've always had a strong advantage with respect to labor, or human capital is another way of looking at it. And that availability of human capital enabled us to achieve a lot of economic success throughout our history. There were other factors as well. Innovation, in, invention, uh, our spirit, With there, there are of course non-tangible qualities about this nation like our spirit, 
and uh, the idea that a lot of people came here to this country from all around the world to make their fortune, whether it was in small ways or, or small families, or then you have uh, the, the individuals like Andrew Carnegie and others who came here and were, became our first true industrialists at the turn of the 19th to 20th centuries. But in all of their cases, whether it was in mechanized work or in agricultural work, they were dependent upon labor. And at times, let's also be honest, that at times that labor was not free uh, in terms of that, that labor did not have their own self-determination. We know very well about slave labor that um, arrived here during our colonial era and continued uh, to be a primary source of labor, particularly in agriculture, until the Civil War and the abolishment of slavery the abolishment of slavery in the United States thereafter. But even um, beyond slavery, uh, legal uh, legal rights of... Oops. But even looking beyond slavery, labor has always been important, and uh, the, the, the availability of it, uh, especially at times in our past where we have seen shifts and transitions of, of our population from one place to another. We started to see migration take effect uh, there's always been a westward migration trend throughout our nation's history that, that kind of has settled down a lot because we have reached both shores and and uh, we are starting to now see some uh, you could say that the east is the new west and so while is the trend for the first say 150 170 years of our nation's history was to go west it's now to go east in a lot of ways but there's also the fact that uh, there has been of course migration from north to south dependent upon labor and that mobility that people have which is a spiritual mobility that we have as a nation and also made possible by the fact that uh, we as a country do not really put in place any barriers in fact our constitution forbids it forbids any legal barriers on people being able to go from one state to another uh, that creates uh, the opportunity for labor to be mobile so the the supply of our labor as well as their mobility uh, enables us to have a su su substantial advantage compared to other parts of the world. Uh, it enabled us to, it enabled us for, for in many cases, not all, but in many cases, enabled us to find a balance between that supply of labor to where we had the supply in order to produce products first in agriculture and then going into the manu into manufacturing, while at the same time um, also be able and manufacture them affordably while at the same time enable uh, labor to enable workers to earn uh, to earn a wage uh, of course they were earning it in a competitive environment but they were able to earn a wage and uh, as such be able to make a living for themselves and also through their own spending or through their own wealth contribute to the continued growth of the economy um, but at the same time that all this was going on you could say that our past was more focused on was more a reflection of self-sufficiency and not as much about efficiency and I, I would say if if you're if you live in a city or in a region if you were to look at kind of how your economy was structured say 50 60 70 years ago and, and kind of look at how the supplies were done and how many how many biz of of all the businesses that served that economy how many of them were headquartered and based within the local area I, I'll give you an example. I was looking online uh, at Facebook uh, to a site that, uh, on a page at Facebook that focuses on the history of the Rocky Mount area. And Rocky Mount um, has had large bakeries in the past for national bakers or regional bakers, but it also has had local bakers that were local producers of bread for uh, grocery stores and such. And someone had taken a picture of a of a wrapper they found for a bread uh, for a brand of bread called Tip Top, and Tip Top was predominantly a brand that was found in a pretty small area of Eastern North Carolina. It was not something that you would find all across the country. Nowadays, when you go to the grocery store to buy bread, nine times out of ten, the same brand of bread that you would find here in Eastern North Carolina in a grocery store like Harris Teeter is probably the same kind of bread you could find in Chicago or find in Atlanta or find in any small community in Kentucky there are not a lot of local brands anymore for products like milk or bread or other things there are a few but um, back then because of supply change because of limits in transportation and communication because those infrastructures had not been developed yet uh, for the most part our economies on the local level were not very efficient but they provide but that lack of efficiency 
did provide the opportunity or provided the necessity uh, for there to be local providers of goods and services. Pretty much whatever you consumed or whatever you needed, with some exceptions, was produced and sold locally. Uh, but that's not the case now, and in some cases there's some positives that as well as some negatives. And now we start looking into um, start looking into the present. And the uh, textbook talks about this some. If you were to look at page one in, in chapter one, and, and it actually comes up uh, in it comes up. And it comes up in chapter 1, page 7, uh, box 1.1. It talks about the new economy, a, a concept that has been developing over time. Um, it's been around for about 25 years. It says it's been around since uh, 1990. Um, and that's, of course, really when we started to notice that the landscape of our economy was changing. Now, for some of us, we can remember life before the new economy. We can remember life in the 70s, and we can remember life in the 80s. And I would even say that the new economy had come along in the 80s because we can remember about how fascinated our overall economy was with Japan. Uh, if you've ever watched movies like Wall Street or, or other movies of that time that were made in the 80s that were about business, there was always references to the Japanese. Uh, they were they were like our 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 counterparts, our competitors, and in some cases our friends in terms of building a global economy. They of course now are a small player compared to other powers in the world, especially China. But at that time that was our principal partner in terms of growing the growing our economy in not just within the United States, but also looking at US the United States role in the broader global economy. And that's why of when you look there's five characteristics of the new economy and the first that we would want to talk about is globalization and globalization I, I'm going to say this there has always been a global economy this nation was founded in part because of global economy the expansion of British I mean of European European exploration and European settlement into North America Central America and South America was in large part driven by global economy the trading has always been global now there are places where it wasn't always global. As I talked about before, there were places where there was a lot of self-sufficiency. But typically, even with that self-sufficiency that you had, you still had to have products and services that you could use to trade beyond your local area. There were those specific things, whether it was agricultural products, manufactured products, other natural resources like metals or other commodities, energy, of course, becoming a big commodity uh, in, in, in the last century or so, and even, I would say last probably 150 years. All of those character, all of those elements helped identify a given location's role in a broader economy. And you could say that that early first phase of globalization was, was kind of that. Um, I would say, you know, this book kind of tries to look at it a little in a little tighter, but to me, uh, globalization has always been prevalent, and I would say the first phase has just kind of been the static globalization. Uh, then you kind of start looking into the the second phase of globalization, and that is more of um, the was when we started actually making more strategic decisions about the allocation of capital for the production of goods or or prov providing of services, but mostly having to do with production of goods. And it was the idea that you started to see more collaboration on the business side. You had companies that were now starting to own uh, properties and own operations and serve customer bases around the world. Whereas it used to be you had a concern in one nation trading with another nation, with a business in another nation about a particular product to benefit their domestic companies, I mean their domestic consumers. Now you had companies that looked to the world as their customer. Uh, you know, this is nothing new. Companies like, uh, particularly if you look at automakers, companies like General Motors and Ford served global markets even before the Second World War. Uh, Ford, Ford built Model Ts all over the world. They weren't just built in Dearborn. They were built all over the world. And, uh, was, and of course, they've, done, they've continued to do that uh, throughout their history as an automaker. 
Uh, same is true with other American companies. The same is true with European companies and, and the Asian companies that have built products elsewhere but have sold products elsewhere for generations. And uh, it, it went away from just simply looking at the world as a source maybe of a particular resource, but also looking at it, where does it make the most sense to manufacture our products? Should we manufacture them closer to our consumers, or should we manufacture them where the cost of production, then when you add transportation and other factors, that the overall cost of production is minimalized so that we can maximize the return on the investment, or maximize profit. And you could say that that trend started to be seen in the United States probably in the 1970s through the 1990s and of course in eastern North Carolina they are very well aware in eastern North Carolina there's a high awareness of this due to the rise of NAFTA and its effect on what had been a long-held industry in eastern North Carolina and that would be the textile industry uh, Rocky Mount, to use as another example, had over a dozen textile plants in the early 1990s, and they're all gone now. That's thousands of jobs in the local economy that were taken away because, in many cases, those companies or the companies that they were supplying fabrics for chose to move manufacturing or uh, start working with vendors and suppliers that could produce fabrics in other countries where labor costs were less. Um, this is kind of that second phase of globalization which really started to have significant repercussions on the overall US economy then we start kind of going into the third um, into the third phase the the globalization 3.0 and and this is kind of referencing what uh, in the in the textbook it refers to the work of Thomas Friedman Thomas Friedman is not truly an economist or a researcher he's an author and he works for the New York Times and he has spent a lot of time traveling around the world and, and studying and trying to figure out how the world is changing and he wrote a book uh, in the mid 2000s before the economic crisis called the world is flat and that book basically talked about how globalization is not just about the idea of finding the most efficient way to produce a product to maximize profit what it's really about is it's about this greater degree of interconnectivity that it's not just about where something is produced but where customers are but also the fact that as as the ability to produce and consume products globally changes and that we all have greater access to the same products in some ways it also leads to some cultural um, some, some, some growing cultural similarities, a, a growing connectivity of cultures. Uh, we've seen this at the national level. We've seen this at the national level throughout the 20th century in the United States. Uh, the development of modern transportation and modern communications has served to bring people together in the United States in ways that it's helped develop, I would say, a broader national culture uh, in terms of what our cultural norms are. There are certainly elements of culture that are still regional or local, but in a lot of ways, what the differences in regional and local culture between localities and regions, say, 50 years ago and where they are today, today is far less. Um, you, can, you can probably think about maybe, for, for those, some of you who've, who've got children or some of you who are, who are kind of in my age range, probably think about you know, how life felt a little more insulated or isolated when uh, wherever you grew up, particularly if you grew up in a small town, and how that life in, in terms of what the norms were and how people acted, and then you went off to a major city, you went to somewhere that was more connected, perhaps for college, and you saw this tremendous culture shock because you saw things you hadn't seen before. And the possibility now as you're raising your kids that even though they may still live in a small town, chances are what they are seeing is more like what they would see in a major city. Not entirely, but a little more like. And, and that's a huge factor. And of course, that changes, that, that, that also creates challenges with respect to the global economy because it also leads to other considerations. Now, it has actually helped the United States in that the United States has become a net exporter of professional services. There are a lot of things that we do as a nation that are not done in other parts of the world. And it has helped us be able to find uh, very strong growth exports uh, that enable us to provide products and services elsewhere that, that, is, that has helped us in terms of strengthening our presence in the global economy. It's also uh, 
uh, I think changed uh, changed some of the ways. It's also led to some changes of domestic culture. And I, I think the one that I think of most, and that would have to be that, for example, if if any of you watch soccer, I don't know if any of you do watch professional soccer, but it used to be, you know, 20 years ago, the only time Americans would really watch soccer was if there was a World Cup or the Olympics or if you happen to watch the U.S. Professional Soccer League. Well, in the last 10 years alone, because of the fact that, that the European, that the uh, English Premier League decided to expand itself and start broadcasting its games globally, much like the NFL had and much like the NBA had, what it created was an opportunity for American audiences to watch the top tier soccer programs in the in the world, which most of them are in Europe, whether it's the English Premier League or the German League or the Spanish League or the Italian League the, or the French League. These are all the predominant soccer leagues of the world. And it's changed how Americans watch soccer. Uh, and a lot of it's just now because we watch the game as it's being played by the best. It just happens that that's on the other side of the on the other side of the Atlantic. So that's that's just one example from a cultural perspective. What it also means, of course, is that it, it changes what people how people have to be prepared in terms of not just knowing perhaps foreign languages or, or knowing histories, but also understanding differences in, in, in cultures of the world and being able to better work with other with people from other nations. Um, I was uh, there's a gentleman in uh, in this area that I hope to uh, get an interview for a later class who has done a lot of study of, of of the economy and politics in North Carolina and he talks about how you know there are some pretty significant employers in the United States that are your and start employers in North Carolina including in some rural areas of North Carolina most of these being kind of towards the center in the Piedmont that are from European companies and one of the challenges is these companies have some pretty significant manufacturing operations they want to have here in the US in part going back to that human capital that workforce argument we made earlier um, they know that we have a growing workforce um, the workforce the native workforce in Europe is not growing it is only able to grow with respect to, to uh, um, immigration whereas the American native workforce continues to grow and we have an immigration workforce and for the most part uh, the workforce that is coming here is a highly desirable workforce it is people who who do want to work and are and and do have some skills or have the ability have some innate natural abilities to learn quickly and adapt effectively but from the standpoint of culture when these European companies or Asian companies or other national companies come to the United States to set up manufacturing operations there is an expectation that the native workforce or the immigrant workforce that has come here to the US is willing to adapt to some cultural norms of the host of the country that's providing the investment and it can lead to some challenges particularly for American workers who might have worked uh, might be familiar with a more traditional American culture uh, and it's not just about like back when we were when they would make movies about Japanese manufacturing they always talked about how the Japanese were the first like to bring workforce calisthenics they would like get up in the morning and you know at before at the start of every day at the factory they would make everybody go through stretching exercises which Americans like no we just show up and start working not a bad idea to go through exercises though but it was a significant difference we're not talking about things like that we're talking about how people are treated uh, understanding you know certain social uh, you know understanding that there's a more openness of culture and society in Europe compared to in some parts of the United States um, you know respecting different religions respect, respecting different lifestyles those type of things the uh, next aspects of the new economy, the knowledge focus. Um, one thing that we see more, even in the manufacturing, but especially in the in the focus on services, is that it is a knowledge-oriented economy. And this gets back to what part of the person really is the strength for the economy. And for a long time in our history, it was our physical ability. It was our it was our it was our it was our ability to build things with our our physical ability with the mind providing some support to that physical ability in other words we, we had great ideas we, we did a lot we could we could come up with a lot of new products but it was really dependent upon our ability to actually make them come alive and that's where the physical labor came into play in the modern economy in this new economy it's really that knowledge drives everything and that the labor side is not as physically significant 
when you watch the video with Joe Max Higgins, that should come up as one of the things about how he, he even describes, and particularly with the metal manufacturing plant, how that particular industry has changed and how it changes how the local workforce that he has in uh, the, the area of uh, Mississippi, the Golden Triangle area, how he how they have to adapt because now instead of more of them doing physical labor there are fewer of them doing a more knowledge based labor that of course that the benefit for them is they get paid more for doing it and then that ties that with knowledge is of course the utilization of technology a lot of what is done even in manufacturing and so many other things is driven by technology if if you and this is something that you can probably find articles for it is something you might want to consider for your article assignment you know there's been a lot of talk of course particularly because we're just finishing up with a presidential election year about the, about manufacturing and about how much of that of those manufacturing jobs are being lost to foreign competition well there is a lot of people who have shown with their own resource research that it we're not losing jobs to the to foreign workers. We may be losing some unskilled labor. We may be losing some lower skilled basic labor jobs to foreign markets. Uh, but the reality is that's because of labor cost. The real thing that's going on, the real shift, is that there's a lot of manufacturing that's staying domestic. But in reality, that, that labor, the labor shifting from humans to machines, technology is making that happen. There's also the role that technology has in making processes more efficient, requiring fewer people involved in, in doing the process. So there are a lot of ways that technology is going to continue to influence us. Uh, the other two elements of uh, the new economy that are important, and we certainly see this in uh, certain sectors of the economy, and it's, it's important that we try to see more of it, have to do with entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, in a lot of ways, the older economy is focused on a, you know, kind of an established set of larger corporations that employ large numbers of people in single locations. Uh, cities and, and, and regions being dependent upon large manufacturers or lar that were in fact large employers like an auto plant or a tire plant or a conglomerate of textile plants plants where a lot of people were paid they weren't paid high wages but they were paid reasonable wages that were kind of in line with the median income the, the, that led to the per perspective of the middle class that they were the ones who really provided the economic base because they were providing the bulk of the income and wealth for the general public because the general public was working for them and the reality being that while these these employers still exist and these employers still go through periods of expansion and moving plants and building new ones that in reality the new economy is also dependent upon nations regions and localities finding ways to create uh, economic opportunity from within one is to encourage more and more people to look at being their own bosses uh, we see that even though the numbers uh, in recent years particularly in the post-recession period have shown that entrepreneurship is still not the way most people go most people look for jobs rather than creating their own uh, but the but the reality being is that there is a need for more people or groups of people to try to work on developing their own business plans or creating new businesses and that ties into innovation creating whether it's creating new technologies to address current issues or to create new products that people may not realize that they necessarily want or need but that will benefit them in some way and you know we we see that a lot and it of course it has positives and negatives but the reality is is that for a lot of um, for a lot of local economies, the the because of the challenges that are created by technology, globalization, and the focus on knowledge, it's important to try to use that knowledge to be innovative in an entrepreneurial fashion, because otherwise you get into a situation where you are having to solely compete against other places for large-scale employment that is still going to be done there is still an element of that that is done 
but in reality the importance of entrepreneurship and innovation uh, is critical and there's probably no better project to look at that and see it than Research Triangle Park um, that, that of course is um, surrounded by Chapel Hill, Raleigh and Durham, North Carolina. You think back to the fact that it's been around for over 50 years that it was developed as kind of a public-private partnership program to provide a large campus to try to attract companies not only to attract existing companies but also to encourage the development of new companies to focus on those sectors of the economy that were going to advance in the second half of the 20th century and beyond um, and of course it led to this large conglomeration in the tech sector and in the healthcare sector and health research and sciences that has continued to pay dividends for the triangle area of North Carolina for the last 30 40 years you look at where um, just probably in the last 10 to 15 years alone there's been there's been unbelievable growth because of the focus that was put on entrepreneurship innovation technology and knowledge these four elements of the new economy all four of them you can find in Research Triangle Park and if someone wanted to look at perhaps finding some articles about RTP those would be good articles as well uh, to look at you may be able to find some research based articles but you probably also can find some more applied articles some other things to think about when we talk about the present landscape more than just the five elements of the new economy uh, and, the, and the book talks a little bit about this but um, you know corporations have changed a lot uh, nowadays you see larger companies and then that's been the face for about 50 years um, you know you started seeing the 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 rise of these conglomerates uh, these publicly traded publicly owned conglomerates they're owned by shareholders but run by corporate boards of directors and and they kind of came into tr into their modern form back in like the 60s in the 50s and 60s when these companies started buying smaller companies and, and trying to create this wide variety of products and services General Electric is probably the one that people think of most in today's world. GE feels like it builds everything, uh, but th that's that's one example. But there's also other companies. There's Siemens, which is based in Germany. Uh, there is uh, there's Bayer, another German company that does, of course, a lot in chemical in in chemicals, agriculture, medicine, and a whole host of other areas. Uh, all of these companies are these companies are, of course, are where a lot of large employment opportunities are found. Uh, these companies produce those opportunities because they are heavily involved in manufacturing. They're multinational folk, they're also the fact that they're multinational creates a challenge particularly for, for nation states, for, for the United States and for other countries because their presence goes beyond national borders and it can create challenges and it can create challenges with respect to trade, with respect to regulation, with respect to uh, workforce development and, and, the, and the utilizations of workforces. There's, there's just a lot of challenges that are created and that's something to look in uh, as you continue your research. I would also say that something you see is that with small business, the ways in which small business succeed today is through probably greater specialization or by provide or by trying to trying to tune themselves to be aware of the products and services that people are willing to pay the right price that you can provide and make money off of because a lot of services that small businesses provide uh, get gobbled up very quickly by technology or by larger providers that have lower that have greater economies of scale and are able to provide services at lower prices um, this is, of course, led in some ways to the resurgence of craft-based small businesses. And we're not just talking about craft breweries, but we're also talking about people that are involved in lost arts, lost uh, lost art and trade skills, uh, whether it be in construction, furniture making, furniture repair, uh, upholstery, or even in other elements of the food economy, like you've seen a large rise in cake makers and bakers a large rise in people that do that are involved in other types of specialty cooking and specialty foods prep or even in specialty agriculture there is a desire for that because people who do have the means uh, from the standpoint of wealth are willing to pay extra for those specialized services that is something that you see more from small business you're less likely to see a small business owner provide just a basic level of service to a broad audience more than likely now 
small business owners are trying to find how can I create a product or service that really reflects my strengths and my skills and my abilities to a certain segment of customers that are willing to pay the price to where I can make this work financially for myself and my family. Of course, this then leads us to the uncertainties in the future. And touching, they kind of touch back. And I want to start from the bottom and go up. So it's a little different. Uh, the global competition for capital, what, what, what this really comes down to is when you think going back to the whole idea of conglomerates and multinational companies and the, the, the competition that exists. And, and, and in the Joe Max Higgins uh, story, you saw how he's competing locally, he's competing nationally, and he's competing globally for these job opportunities for the area that he serves. And what we're really talking about is capital investment. Because with the, the shrinking and the globalizing of our economy, it has shifted where the resources are. And because localities have gone from being self-sufficient and inefficient to being perhaps more efficient and interconnected, they've also lost some control of their own destiny from the perspective of they perhaps don't have the same capital that they had before. And so it means that places find themselves, locations find themselves more dependent upon trying to secure that outside capital that they need to try to facilitate either continuing economic development or in a lot of cases trying to establish a resurgence in economic development or economic growth. That of course then ties in when you start thinking about things like technology and 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 culture and um, and other things that we talked about that have to do with the new economy goes into the rural versus urban or the urban versus rural market. Back when labor, back when labor was uh, was was the key, when human labor, when physical human labor was really the key, it it didn't matter. It it you could find ways to amass that labor in different sizes, and you could have both urban manufacturing and rural manufacturing. Typically, rural manufacturing was where you would have less um, sophisticated, less skilled opportunities, but because they were rural environments, the cost of living was lower so that the wages could, could kind of align up. Uh, there were a lot, of small text, uh, a lot of small clothing manufacturers that you see dotted all over the landscape of the southeast. You can go to old factories and, that are now closed up because of globalization, and you can find that in every little town, there was at least some company there making some kind of clothing product, a shirt, jeans, um, something was being made in those locations. And that reason why was because there were enough workers in those locations to justify putting a plant there, and the and the and the and the economies and the economic and the economies of scale worked out for the employer as well as for the residents that worked there. That's not the case anymore. What's happened now is, whereas before, say 50 years ago, 100 years ago, urban centers were large centers for man, for large scale heavy manufacturing that needed to be that needed to have relative access to easy transportation and communications such places like Detroit or Chicago or even trade pl places where trade was significant like New York what's happened is because they have other types of infrastructure built in like edu like higher education institutions or elite higher education institutions access to capital access to markets and 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 broader broader cultures uh, where they have more globalized influence and more connections to a broader global economy, those have become the center the center points for the emergence of new economy businesses, where it's more knowledge focused, and you can see that in a lot of places. You think about Raleigh, and you think about the growth of the knowledge and technology economies in the Raleigh area or in Durham, or you see it in San Francisco, you see it in Seattle, and it's in a lot of places where you can see that there are a lot of other resources that are available in these places. It's not just a, and it's not just about size, but the size certainly helps, and that creates a big challenge for rural areas where these resources are not readily available. And of course, another challenge is having to do with, well, for that work that does need to be done, that work that does require labor, it comes down to, are we seeing human labor being replaced by machines? In a lot of ways, it is. We've seen that with mechanization and manufacturing and with the use of robots. 
we are now starting to see it in other areas. The thought of driverless cars being available not just as personal means of transportation but also as ways to provide say taxi cab or transit level service or drive or, or handle the uh, transport of cargo and trucks. Uh, there's other areas where the use of some forms of artificial intelligence, not full-scale artificial intelligence, but some degree of automated decision-making using algorithms can help make it possible for make it possible for software to do the work that's currently done by lawyers or by other an analytical type analytical type jobs. Kind of creates some concerns because it creates a lot of uncertainty because we don't know yet what jobs are going to still be here and which jobs aren't. And there's a lot of research out there and a lot of articles that you can find that deal specifically with this. Where they'll sit there and say, these are the jobs that are going to be gone in 10 years. Or they'll say, these are the jobs that are going to be gone in 20 years. Or they'll say, these are the jobs that are still going to be around. And the real question is, who's right and who's not? So those are some things to consider uh, as you look at the uncertain future of our economy. Of course, what this all does is it requires us to be responsive. It requires us to try to develop strategies for economic development because what happens without it? And as you go into the final part of chapter one, what you find is that there's a lot of things that happen without economic development. And it creates, and the reason, I mean, and the, at the end of the day, the the growth saw I mean it's kind of like in in sports winning cures all ills in a team if a team is not doing well inside if you're losing obviously it's a problem but if you're winning well everybody gets along or if people don't get along they kind of go well it's no big deal because we're winning and when it comes to the economy if a local economy is doing well it can kind of make it to where you don't have to necessarily worry about other pieces of policy which is the reason why it, and it's kind of like a cause and effect. You don't know which is which. But politicians are more likely, and also government leaders, administrators, are more likely to focus on economic development than they are on other issues. Because even though trying to engineer the economy is not easy, there is a more substantive and easier to develop metric for figuring out success. And, and honestly, it comes down to jobs. Um, you know, that that really is the measure jobs and income and when when a when a city council is able to what and this is of course through the economic developer through someone like Joe Max Higgins is able to land that company to come in and they get to have that that groundbreaking ceremony where everyone gets their nice little uh, you know, brass plate or gold plated shovel, and they get to shovel some dirt and wear the hat, and you see this mock up of this new building that's going in, or they get to go to a ribbon cutting of a new retail, like a grocery store that's going to hire 60 or 70 people, and they get to look at those gains in large numbers. It's going to make them feel good because it's, it's easy to translate what happens there to the public. It's a lot harder to translate trying to actually work on some of the other issues that come up when you don't have economic development. It's, you, it's easier to try to look at economic development as a way to cure other problems. Uh, what we see today is we see a lot of disparities and inequalities. And the disparities are more, I would say, comparing us to other areas. The inequalities come when you start looking at individual human characteristics. When you start looking at uh, the, ine the inequities, that, the inequalities with respect to uh, the lives of the lives of minorities or you look at those who are immigrants or you look at those who don't have access to higher educations and you start realizing that there are begin we are beginning to see and we've been seeing for a significant amount of time now but what we are really seeing even to a greater extent and what this all ties to is the fact that for a larger share of people and for a growing share of the population there is a belief that they cannot get the good jobs and this are those are the jobs where there's some degree of job security there is a degree of consistency in in work hours they get their pay they get benefits benefits which of course have developed over the last 50 years whether it's vacation time or health insurance or retirement and that the jobs carry with them some source of dignity that they are seen as being constructive and productive and to be brutally honest, 
you can look at what happened both in 1992 in the 1992 presidential election and more so in the 2016 presidential election and i would argue when you if you were to look at the vote distribution that the i would look at it on a per county level in a lot of states in the northeast and in the midwest places like michigan and particularly in michigan and in pennsylvania and ohio which donald trump won in 2016 and i believe bill clinton won those states in 1992 you would find that you could tie the job situation in those rural in those declining areas and tie it and correlate it directly to election results in favor of the candidate that wins the national election um, it goes back, of course, to what James Carville said in 1992. It's the economy, stupid. And that was as much the case 24 years later with the 16 election as it was in 1992, and as it was in prior elections as well. The economy drives presidential politics, especially. It can also drive congressional politics and local politics, but it has a especially strong role in driving national politics. And um, that is where we are. The chapter talks a little bit more about socioeconomic impacts and, and of course about really looking at how the lack of economic growth and the lack of economic opportunity can really create challenges. And to kind of con wrap up this part and you think about what uh, Joe Max Higgins talked about, how he talked about when he went to them how the mindset of the elected officials was very small. They talked to him about wanting a movie theater. Because to them it was like, well, we didn't have something that ever that other people had, and he looks at it and he realizes that this is a case. And at the same time, he's kind of being tough with them. He's also at the same time being understanding and realizing. And I don't want to be, be paraphrasing what the what the newly elected president or newly inaugurated president would say is, you know, they weren't winning anymore. And at the end of the day, economic development is about winning. Uh, it's very clear with what Joe Max Higgins says. It's very clear with the with what the new president of the United States is saying. Economic development is about winning. It's about creating that sense of winning that we are achieving and that we are moving forward and that we are gaining and that we are building and we are growing. And what becomes re, what, what, what the reality becomes is that if you're not growing, you're declining. And you look at and as we kind of start going further into this semester and you start looking at the indicators and you start building the county scans uh, the regional scans of your counties and you start tying in the labor market and, and other pieces of data that we're going to pull and start seeing all these different economic measures you start to see that rarely do things just stay stay steady you're either going up or you're going down um, there are a lot of factors that have changed how that has happened in more recent years but the reality is is it's still you're either moving in a positive direction or a negative direction you don't just stay stable um, same is true in the in the household a lot of times and the same is true with the economy overall and and that can create some challenges because it's if if you start having a period if a, if a period of decline starts lasting longer than it normally should then you start wondering well when is it going to turn around because um, you know one of the things that we'll talk a little bit more as we go forward is that economic there is economic volatility you know the shit the changing in the economy is a given there's a given that there are going to be cycles of periods of growth and periods of decline it's when the periods of decline never end or and in comparison some other people's periods of growth grow uh, can continue without end is when people start wondering and that's what we see and that's what people who work in economic development try to address what th their goal of course is they want to win all the time but what they especially want to do is that if there is a period of decline they want it to be as short as possible and they want the growth to start as quickly as possible so to wrap up with this lecture let's talk a little bit about the new economy and how kind of say ask yourself how the new econ economy has impacted your career choices you know think about that are you know these you don't have to write these down if you want to discuss them uh, in the if you want to kind of discuss them on the discussion board you're more than welcome to uh, you know also thinking what have, what have you chosen to do and even if you know it, obviously y'all are probably thinking of careers in public administration or working in public administration but the reality is even some jobs in public administration may be gone in 10 years we're, we're kind of slow on the uptake in this area as an industry but it, it may happen um, and then 
thinking about what we've talked about here and what's been in the text and what's been in some of the other stuff you've read and seen, you know, right now if you were asked from a policy perspective by a local leader, what what's one thing they can do your your hometown can do to respond to what's going on now and what could be going on, you know, what would that be? So these are just some things to think about as you kind of look back on this lecture as we move forward now with this course in economic development.